Um, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Nupime, the Cure for White Ladies, the fourth event in this year-long oral history workshop series, Oral History and Power. Um, my name is Carlin Leizia, and I help to co coordinate the series along with Amy Starchesti, um, who's here tonight to, to help us welcome um, Leanne. Um, and I also instruct the accompanying course um, here in the Columbia Oral History Master of Arts program. Um, and I am with you all this afternoon, afternoon for me, um, from the unceded lands of the Chechenyo and Ohlone people. Um, I'm on um, the western slope of a very big hill. Um, and as you'll see from the sort of constant glare, um, the sun sets very slowly here. Um, thank you all for uh, sharing a bit about where you each are now um, and feel free to continue doing so. Um, for those who were with us last week, uh, you've heard a little bit of my own thinking about um, nouns versus verbs um, and especially to do with land acknowledgement. Um, so I just want to thank you for participating in acknowledging the land with me. Um, at Columbia University, uh, and still, as we're all working remotely, um, we are situated and, and dependent on the unceded lands of the Lenape people um, who are violently dispossessed from the place we now call New York City. Um, and we, as a program, honor their roots um, before and below the campus of Columbia University um, and, and also the strength it has taken to resist and rebuild um, both there and, and elsewhere. Um, as oral historians, we also acknowledge the roots of our practice in indigenous oral history um, and the ways in which our field has excluded indigenous peoples and practices um, by displacing and repositioning them as sort of merely oral tradition. Um, and we, we really highly recommend Napier Mahuika's work uh, as a starting place or a kind of continuing, continuing place for this particular unlearning and its replacement um, with truth. Uh, I'll just pop that title into the chat in case you're, oh, thanks Amy, you're on it. Um, so, you know, this, this acknowledging is only the beginning of a process of building the honoring of indigenous land, people and knowledge into our practices as oral historians uh, and as, as people um, uh, for the purposes of healing, reconciliation, learning, resurgence and the pursuit of justice. Um, so welcome again, it looks like we probably have everyone now. Um, and welcome back to those of you who were with us last week. Um, if you missed last week's presentation, you can now watch the full recording um, up on our YouTube channel. Thank you, Lauren, for getting that started. Um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, Suzanne and Sarah's presentation from last week. Um, and among other things, the pedagogy that they modeled for us um, in terms of how we we're all both learners and teachers um, at different points and, and simultaneously. Um, and uh, our guest tonight, Leanne Vida Sumase Simpson, um, writes about this dynamic also in, in her book, especially Dancing on Our Turtles' Backs. Um, and that has been a huge uh, inspiration for me recently. And um, in terms of sort of what it means to learn and, and how we learn and how we think about learning, um, and Amy will more formally introduce Leanne in just a minute, but I wanted to take the opportunity also to uh, name some of my some of my thinking around your work, Leanne, um, and uh, sort of in connection with our series in general and, and building on um, what we learned from Sarah and Suzanne last week. Um, I, I revisited Dancing on Our Turtles back today and uh, now I'm realizing that I, I didn't finish writing my remarks because I got distracted just rereading your words. Um, but one of the uh, one of the quotes that I um, had underlined before and, and really came back to, um, you know, how you how you write about it being our responsibility to find meaning in the stories that we hear, um, but also that and, and now I'll just quote you. Um, it can take many years after hearing a story to know the meaning of that story in one's heart, for it to become a truth. Yet the process of it becoming heart knowledge or deb we win is the process of integrating that echo into one's experience. Um, so that's just that, 
where I'm coming from today and uh, something that I wanted to, something of Leanne's that I wanted to share with you all. Um, and now, uh, Amy, if you wanna take it away. Thank you, Kylan. Um, and welcome, Leanne. I, I'll be honest, this is actually the third time that I invited Leanne to speak in our annual public programming series. Um, I invited her to speak three years ago in the series on oral history and the future and embodied knowledge and embodied memory. And then I invited her to speak on the series on oral history and storytelling. And now I invited her to speak in the series on oral history and power. Um, and that says in part that she's busy and it's hard to schedule a trip to New York. Um, but also that I think it shows how much her work is really centrally important and relevant to so many of the biggest and deepest and most important and most challenging questions that we're thinking about in the field of oral history. And so I'm so grateful to be able to, to have her here and to have this conversation, especially to have it with all of you, a, a really global uh, audience, which we wouldn't have been able to do had we had it in person in New York. Um, I was first introduced to her work by Valerie Fenn and Roseanne Gooding Silverwood, so I want to thank them. Um, and ended up with the books sort of constantly on my coffee table in my office because I would bring them out to recommend to a student and then put them away and then bring them out to recommend to another student and then put them away and then bring them out to recommend to another student and then put them away and they've really become central to my own thinking in particular about the place of stories in social life and the relationship of stories and land and people and the complicated interrelationships there. And, and most exciting to me, the, the, the liveliness of stories, the way that stories transform as we tell them and as we use them and how important it is for stories to be told and to be heard and to be cared for in order for them to, to stay alive. Um, and I want to also particularly um, thank her for uh, her writing and acknowledgement of the role of uh, parenting in her learning process. Um, I think so often our lives as parents are invisible in our public lives and the fact that she's written so compellingly and so honestly about what she's learned and taught through parenting and through being a parent um, has been really critical for me personally. So a little bit more formally, Leanne Bira Samusig Simpson is a Mishisagik Nishinabek scholar, writer, and artist, as we know. Um, I don't usually want to read the, the full bio, but the sentence is so good that I'm going to share it. Uh, her work breaks open the intersections between politics, story, and song, bringing audiences into a rich and layered world of sound, light, and sovereign creativity. Sovereign creativity. I love that. Um, she got a PhD. She got a professor job. She quit that job and for the last 20 years uh, has been working in indigenous land-based education, um, although she lectures and teaches in universities pretty regularly. She's the author of five award-winning books, including The Accident of Being Lost, As We Have Always Done, Indigenous Freedom Through Radical Res Resistance, um, and my favorite, Dancing on Our Turtle's Back, which Carlin already cited. Um, and her new novel that we're hearing about tonight uh, is out this fall. She's also a musician combining poetry, storytelling, songwriting, and performance in collaboration with musicians to create unique spoken songs and soundscapes. And her fourth record is coming out, is out this year. She's a member of the Alderville First Nation. Um, so I invite you all to join me in welcoming Leanne and thanking her for spending her time with us this evening. Thank you, Leanne. Oh, miigwech, uh, Carlin and Amy, for those uh, very kind words. Bajo kinuaya, kirigabajuna denawema, kinigachi anishabe gogumina donjaba, negojawani megwado da, bidas musa, ke nedijnikas, nigichinendam gibijain, gibin wachanguk. I'm so honored to finally be here uh, visiting with, with you all tonight. Um, I do have a new novel out. Um, it's coming to the US in the new year. The University of Minnesota Press is, is publishing Nopuming. Um, and so this is the first time that I've talked about it to an American audience. And I just want to take a few steps back and sort of contextualize the book in, the, in, uh, in my own practice and, and in my own life. So I am Michi Sagi Kanishnabek or Ojibwe, and my homeland is the North Shore of Lake Ontario. 
um, the Michisagi Kanishinaabek are located in the eastern part of Ojibwe territory. And so we have close ties to the Haudenosaunee Confederacy with whom we share take care, care, care taking responsibilities uh, with for Lake Ontario. My particular understanding of life comes from this part of the world. It comes from this Michisagi Knishnabek practice of life, of living in deep relationality with the land, the waters, the plants, the animals, and the peoples of Kinagachi and Nishnabek Ogaming, the place where we all live and work together. It comes from Neyano Nibimong Gichigaming, or the Great Lakes. It comes from maple sugar bushes carrying and filtering water from the soil combining it with light and converting it to sweet sugar. It comes from lake shores full of minoman or wild rice, gathering strength in mid-July and moving from a floating to a standing position. It comes from black bears that wake up in Makwagizis or February, turn in their dens on beds of blueberry branches and then settle back into fasting and dreaming for a few more weeks. This land has taught me that Anishinaabe life is continual, reciprocal, reflective, and often a critical interaction with my ancestors, those yet to be born, and the nation of plants and animals I share land with. It is a living constellation of co-resistance with all of the anti-colonial peoples of the earth and the worlds they build. Anishinaabe life is a persistent world building process in spite of and despite of the constant imposition of dispossession and the colonial machinery of elimination. This is a procedure for indigenous life and indigenous living that indigenous people used long before our existence depended upon our ability to resist and survive the violence of capitalism heteropatriarchy and expansive dispossession. My ancestors woke up each morning and they built a Nishnabe life. They animated their system of governance and diplomacy. They built their collective philosophical and ethical understandings. They made processes for solving conflicts and reestablishing balance. They built their economy with the consent of the plant and animals they shared land with. They built and maintained and nurtured systems for sharing knowledge and taking care of each other. They worked collectively to produce, reproduce, replicate, amplify, and share Anishinaabe life. Because if they didn't, Anishinaabe worlds wouldn't exist. They were makers. They got up and they worked hard, not the white man wage labor, nine to five, Monday to Friday kind of work, not the kind of work where you outsource the labor of living so you can do something more important, but the kind of work that values the way one lives. They got up, worked hard all day long to build a life, to build a world where all life is precious. This algorithm of living, theory and praxis seamlessly intertwined and relationally responsive to one another is generated through relations with Michisagi Kinishnabek land, land that is constructed and defined by our intimate, spiritual, emotional, and physical relationship to it. Living as a creative act, self-determination, consent, kindness, freedom at the core, making as a material basis for experiencing and influencing the world, living with the purpose of generating continual life replicated over and over. Our infrastructure for life was relationships, not institutions. Our orientation for life was internationalist, we shared space and time with plants, animals, and different indigenous nations, mostly without the use of enclosures and violence. We did not bank capital to protect us against hard times. In times of struggle, 
We relied upon reciprocal relationships with other animal and plant nations, other human families, and neighboring indigenous nations in our practice of relational diplomacy. We have always been an intellectual and an artistic people. We have always had theory, meaning, philosophy, and ethics. And that theory, meaning, philosophy, and ethics was communicated and is communicated through the practice of storytelling. Telling stories is a foundational practice of indigenous people. The practice of telling stories fills interstitial spaces of worlds with sound, meaning, recognition, and affirmation with all of the generative and degenerative energies. It is a practice of listening with one's open heart to the sound of Anishinaabe across time and space in all of its diverse manifestations. The practice of telling stories is the practice of sharing and generating a diversity of meanings. It is a practice of deep relationality, not a looking at, but a looking with, or a looking through, or a thinking through together. The practice of telling stories is a practice of scaling and releasing sound across scales, articulating our individual experiences, relating them to collective experiences, and generating systemic critique. More important than the telling is the culture of listening. The practice of telling stories is a practice of constantly building Anishinaabe worlds while simultaneously living in them without apology. We are bodies made of stories and connection, hubs in the network of indigenous living. And our practice of telling stories is one of the reasons that I'm here today in spite of four centuries of violence. About 20 years ago now, I moved back to my territory, subsequently quit a tenure track position at our local university. There were lots of personal and complicated reasons for this, but one of those reasons was that I wanted to put Anishinaabe intellectual practices, Anishinaabe ways of generating knowledge at the center of my life, not as something to study, but as something that I wanted to become. The imposition of the Western Academy was too rigid and constrictive in supporting me to create the body of work that I wanted to create. I don't even think I knew at the time what I wanted to create, except that I didn't, that I did want Anishinaabe intellectual practices to be the spine of that work. That meant living a different life. It meant putting the land and land-based practices at the center things like the sugar bush and the making of maple syrup, hunting, medicine making, ceremony, language learning, harvesting wild rice, and of course, storytelling. It has meant now a two decade relationship with Michi Sagi Kanishnabek elder Doug Williams from Curve Lake First Nation. It's meant learning and sharing and generating knowledge in a different way than I had been trained by the Academy. I feel like you're the perfect audience to tell this. Uh, I fell in love with the oral tradition. Um, although that to me, that terminology to me sort of diminishes the breadth and the complexity of Anishinaabek intellectual practices or knowledge systems. The theoretical foundations of our knowledge systems come from our origin stories. These are the stories that tell us the importance of sound and frequency, of movement, of our bodies, of collective practice, all, of, all as ways of generating knowledge. It's these uh, origin stories that give birth to our making cultures and a series of land-based practices that build worlds based on this deep relationality with all living things. Engaging in these world building practices, particularly in commune with others, generates knowledge, generates stories, generates connection and attachment. Stories then become the sound uh, that fills those 
um, tiny spaces of life with imaginings, with affirmations and negations. I first started to write about this in my book, um, Dancing on Our Turtle's Back. And when I began working on this project, I was about 10 years into to working with uh, my elder Doug. And I remember really clearly asking him if he would help me with the book. I imagined interviewing him, transcribing the interview, and then I imagined cutting and pasting those big brilliant quotes into the text. Because that was the only way I knew how to bring Anishinaabe brilliance into uh, intellectual and academic writing and in, into the academy. And his answer uh, really, <laughs> really screwed me up for a while and changed, changed the course of things. Doug said, yes, I'd be happy to help, but you can't interview me. I hate interviews. I always end up looking stupid. I knew exactly what he meant. I had spent my dissertation studying the impact of documenting what was, was called at the time traditional ecological knowledge and writing about how documenting this knowledge was a process of removal, removing the knowledge from the land, removing the knowledge from the knowledge holder and the body and the person that held responsibilities for it, removing it from the language, uh, converting it from a sound and a relationship into text. I argued that this prospect was restricted and it restricted the ability of knowledge to make meaning because our knowledge system is one that generates meaning from context, from relationships, not contents. I knew from working with Doug that oftentimes my depth of a certain concept or practice or story would deepen over time um, by spending time with him out on the land doing stuff. My work with the sugar bush is a really good example of this. Um, you can see, you're starting to be able to see um, over time how my relationship with the sugar bush and my knowledge of the sugar bush and my telling of those sugar bush stories is deepening um, as we're sort of walking through this, this together. Um, this is because I think the Anishinaabe stories are constructed in a very particular way that encourages a diversity in the tellings, um, a layering of meaning within the story, and stories in this sense to me are a kind of code or an algorithm that reveals meanings over time with a sustained and embodied engagement. I've tried to bring um, these Anishinaabe aesthetics and storytelling practices into my written work, um, particularly into my fiction and most prominently into this new book uh, called Nopaming. Um, so I think one of the things that I wanted to talk about tonight is um, how this uh, oral, oral storytelling is really the spine of my, uh, my fictional writing and also my academic work. Um, I have degrees in biology, um, I have an interdisciplinary PhD, I haven't been to creative writing school, and so um, the way that I have been trained is very much with, with Doug and very much um, in the oral tradition. And so these Anishinaabe aesthetics, uh, repetition, um, having the story take place in the physical world and then also the spiritual world, um, having a, kind of a circular nature to the story rather than a linear uh, past, present, future. All of these types of things um, I'm using in my, in my uh, creative work. And so I wanted to share a couple of pieces with you. Um, and then I wanna talk a little bit about, about Nopaming, the new book. Um, so the first piece, I'm just going to uh, alert Carlin to get um, under your always light ready. Um, so this is a piece that is um, 
is from this book, The Accident of Being Last, which is a book of short stories. Um, it started out as a poem. It then became a song. Uh, and then it became a, a short film. In the first version of this, this piece, I was, I was writing about the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women, um, two spirit, queer people and trans people. Um, this is something that there's been a, a public discussion about in Canada, there's been a national inquiry. Um, and I was wanted to do something creative in response to this crisis. So in Anishinaabe storytelling traditions and in Cree and in Dene storytelling traditions, there is a, um, there is a, a bunch of stories about escape, about a fugitivity, um, escaping a famine, escaping conflict, escaping um, bad, bad sorts of things. And so I use these escape narratives, or I was drawn to these escape narratives because very much my experience of being an Anishinaabe Kwe and Ojibwe woman in contemporary Canadian culture is one where I feel like there's a target on my back and I have to escape these sorts of situations. So I took that oral story um, and that, that sort of uh, gesturing towards that, that story and wrote, this poem. Um, it was then I worked with um, Jonas Vanetta and James Button who composed the music. And I was very surprised when I when I heard the 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 um, the uh, demo of the music because it was a very electronic, upbeat, sort of happy feel to the music, very electronica. And I was thinking in my head that this is sort of a this is a, a song that has a weight to it. Um, in our conversation and in our collaboration, they felt like uh, my escape, my um, survival, my uh, refusing this phenomenon of missing and murdered indigenous women was a celebration. And so they liked and we liked the sort of pairing of these lyrics. Um, with that music. Then Elmaya Telfeathers, who is a Blackfoot uh, Sami filmmaker, made a kind of a mini documentary about this amazing um, Kwak Kwakalak Nuhalk um, woman uh, who is a boxer. Um, she's from Vancouver Island on Canada's west coast and they collaborated and made this this visual documentary. So there's um, there's, there's sort of these, these three layers, the, uh, the lyrics, the music, the visuals, um, and this has been a way of, of layering meaning. And so we'll take a, we'll take a, a look at this, uh, this short, it's short uh, piece. So that um, is under your always light. And there is a, a question, not really a question in the chat about the line, um, two husbands and a wife and make them all feel insane with good love. And that's a reference to, um, to, the, to the fact that Anishinaabe culture has more than two genders, um, a diversity of sexual orientations and a diversity of relationship orientations. So uh, one of the things that I've tried to do in my creative work um, and I've talked a lot about in As We Have Always Done is um, taking queerness and normalizing it uh, because that's, that's uh, how uh, my ancestors did it. Um, let me see. The next one that I want to uh, show is, is called How to Steal a Canoe. And I'm going to tell you the oral story first that this piece is based on um, because it was an oral story first and then it, it, it's a contemporary Anishinaabe Leanne oral story. Then it became a poem. Then it became a song. Uh, it's been a performance. And it's, uh, it's also a short film. So 
Uh, the elder that I've worked with, Doug, I live in Peterborough, Ontario. Um, a few blocks from my house is the Canadian Canoe Museum, which Canada is extraordinarily proud of. And uh, it started with uh, uh, a white man who collected an enormous number of canoes um, from all kinds of different Indigenous people, uh, mostly all over Canada, but some from, from the US as well. And it has now been made into a museum about the canoe. And so it's, um, it has uh, some, some tense relationships with local First Nations and with, with also um, Indigenous people all over Canada because, as museums do, because um, some of these, some of our belongings are, are in these places and we, we don't, um, we aren't able to have relationships with them anymore. And so a few years ago, uh, a family from England called the Canoe Museum. They were cleaning out their garage and they found a birch bark canoe that was very, very old that their kind of great, great grandfather had brought back from my territory uh, to England and they wanted to give it back. And so they gave it back to the Canoe Museum. The Canoe Museum took this Mississauga Michisagi Knishnabek canoe and they phoned Doug, at the local First Nation, they phoned the elder and they said, you know, can you come to the museum and do the, the welcome, the stolen canoe home ceremony? <laughs> and Doug was like, well, we don't really have a ceremony for that, but sure, I can come and do something. And so he phoned me to help him. He phoned a couple of other people to help. And we went to the, the canoe museum I really wanted to get into kind of the warehouse where they kept all of these, kept this collection. And um, there was so many different canoes from so many different nations there. And we met this, this canoe that had been away from our homeland for so long. And so I was thinking about ways of reconnecting to it. I was singing um, to the canoe. When the security guard wasn't looking, I was dipping my fingers into a plastic bottle of water and rubbing the drops on the spine of a canoe because I thought if I had been this canoe, I would have been really missing water. Um, I was praying to it. And as a language learner, I'm not very good at the language. And so I asked Doug in, uh, in the grammar of Anishinaabe, there's a division between animate and inanimate objects. And you have different verb endings depending on whether the object is alive or not living. And so I asked him if the canoe is animate or inanimate. And he said, it's, it's uh, animate, it's alive. And I remember thinking, of course it is because it's made out of these four trees. And there would have been this process of consent and relationship in the harvesting of these materials, in the weaving and the making um, and the joining of these two, of these four materials with heat and water in order to make the canoe. And so this was sort of a series of treaty relationships. It was a source of, it was sort of a treaty of ethical relationships that we were kind of re um, integrating back into back into our lives. And so that really struck me. I asked him what we would do if the canoe was in was had been given back to us. And he said that when our ancestors were done with canoes, they would sink them with seven stones into the bottom of the lake. And then they, the the materials would would break back up and be returned to the to the land. So I went home and uh, I wrote a poem called How to Steal a Canoe. And I worked with a Cree cellist, Chris Dirksen, um, and she wrote the music. And then I worked with Amanda Strong, who's a Métis filmmaker from East Vancouver again. And um, she did a stop motion animation called How to Steal a Canoe based on, based on that oral story. So that was how to steal a canoe. Um, and that brings us to, to Nopaming. Um, this is a cover of Nopaming. The American cover is actually very similar. Um, it, it's in a different font. The cover image is a, an image by Rebecca Belmore, who is an Anishinaabe 
performance artist. Um, the title Nopaming is a word that means in the bush. Uh, and the title is a reference to a book that was written in the mid 1800s by Susanna Moody, who is a white woman um, and very celebrated in, in Canadian literature as one of the first white women, as the first white woman who wrote um, in Canada. She wrote a, a book called Roughing It in the Bush, uh, which was meant as a guidebook for <laughs> colonizers and settlers coming into my territory uh, in the area north of Peterborough, Ontario, and, and settling. And it's, uh, it's got some extremely anti-Black parts. It's got some very, very racist, anti-Indigenous uh, descriptions of Michisagi Kanishnavek people. And so I've always sort of written in uh, proximity to this book. And I wanted to use this book as a jumping off point. Um, Susanna Moody, it, that, that the, after the title, there's no reference to her or, or white people in the book and that's the cure. Um, but it's sort of a, a building or a showing, a revealing of, of the worlds that uh, Susanna Moody's white supremacy didn't allow her to see. So it's my first attempt at a longer form. Um, it is not uh, a typical novel uh, because when I set out to write something in longer form coming from an oral practice and an oral culture, we don't have a novel and a novel uh, and the structure of a novel is something that's very Western. It's a very Western literary form. It's a very foreign literary form to me. Um, and so this novel um, really centers relationality. Um, there are seven characters in the book and uh, they have very deep relationships to each other. And that relationality kind of forms a web that, that becomes a place. Um, the narrator is Mashkawaje which means she is frozen in the ice or he or they, because we don't have gender pronouns. Um, all of the, the characters, the main characters use they, them pronouns as a way of normalizing queerness and opening up the story for uh, folks of all genders to be able to see themselves in, in the narrative. Um, it includes non-human characters. Uh, one of my favorite characters in the book is Ninatik, which is a maple tree. Um, there's also Adik, a caribou character. Um, the main characters are a multi-aged group. The spiritual world is real and influencing. Um, song is both a source of knowledge in my culture and in the book. Um, Badabin, the concept of Badabin is really important in the book. Badabin is a word in my language that means uh, dawn, literally, or that first light that kind of peaks up over the horizon before the sun rises. And if you take that word and you split it into its, its three smaller uh, components, the bi is a prefix that means the future is coming at you. The da means the present or home and ba or ban is a suffix that you would put on the end of someone's name after they pass. So that first light of dawn is literally the present um, and it's made out of the, the past and the future collapsing in on itself. So there's a presencing in the book. Um, it takes place in Toronto and in Peterborough and all of these kind of fragments of, of wild spaces amongst the urban um, it's a cyclical story, so you can almost start at any point in the book. I paid a lot of attention to sound and rhythm. Um, there's lots of Anishinaabe Moan or Ojibwe language in the book that isn't translated, but it's Google-able. Um, there's an online dictionary called the Ojibwe People's Dictionary, and all the words are in there. And there's a couple of musical projects that, have, that are going along in the book. Um, I was set to, this book came out in Canada in the fall uh, during the pandemic. And so in the spring, when everybody went into lockdown, uh, my sister Ansley and I worked on a short EP called The Nopaming Sessions, um, which you can find on Bandcamp. And it is just four tracks of original music that she composed um, and, I'm reading from the novel over that music. 
And then the second project is a full um, album of songs uh, that's from the middle component of the book called The Theory of the Theory of Ice, and it's coming out in March. Um, we're going to hear the first chapter, which is called Solidification. Um, so it's it's a very gentle way of starting and of drawing the, the reader, or in this case, the listener into the book. Um, the music is by my sister Ansley, and that's her, her voice that you'll hear. Um, the short film is by Sammy Chien and the Chimeric Collective. Sammy is a Taiwanese Canadian artist working in Vancouver. And he took the, um, the, the music and uh, used the stems. So when you're recording music, you record a stem for each instrument. Um, so he took the stems that we used to, to make the song and put them into Isadora, which is a live video processing software. Um, and it generated images. Um, so it's a different way of editing. We, we input the image, but um, the software generates the image and um, puts images to each channel and to each stem and then um, plays it back and syncs it. So we wanted to have a really ephemeral feel to, um, to the, the short film. And um, you're, you're getting introduced to the character of Mash Kawaje. Uh, which is the narrator, and this is the the person that's that's frozen in in ice. So that's solidification, and there's actually um, another version that you'd be able to find on YouTube with um, with closed caption as well and uh, art from uh, Toshoni, um, artist Leanne Charlie. So that's everything that I have to share. Um, the book, No Puming, comes out in the US in February, um, the University of Minnesota Press, and uh, I hope you get a chance to, to spend some time with it. Thank you for, for listening and for coming, and I think we have time for questions. Yeah. Yes. Leanne, thank you so much. Um, that was amazing. Uh, the chat is, is blowing up um, and the, all of the faces that I can see are, are very excited and I'm sure there are lots of questions out there. Um, folks, feel free to um, put your responses or, or your questions into the chat or um, kind of raise your hand there are so many different configurations for how to do this. Um, if you're raising your hand, it, your actual hand, um, and I'm not calling on you, your page is back. So feel free to kind of unmute or, or indicate in the chat that you're there wanting to ask a question. Um, and Lauren, I think will help me kind of look for folks. Um, there's one that's come in in the chat here from Meg um, that I'll just read out in case folks are just listening. Um, Meg asks, can you explain the time lapses in this book representative of your culture's lived realities or your own, uh, where you draw most of your inspiration from, you said in the past? Uh, and where did you draw the inspiration from in this novel with regards to, sorry, as things are coming into the chat, this message is moving up. <laughs> um, and where did you draw the inspiration from in this novel with regards to the organization of plot, particularly the theme of healing and the progression of momentary lapses of time? And the interaction of personified characters that regenerate the whole. There's a lot there. Um, well, I think that um, I, I think that I carry an Anishinaabe world around in my head. I live in an Anishinaabe world. Um, my when I'm interacting with with other Anishinaabe people, and it sort of exists. You know, it's not always visible to. Um, to non-Indigenous people. So I really wanted to um, sort of grow that world and bring people into to that Anishinaabe world that is, that is, um, that's alive and that's influencing and that, that exists in real time. 
Um, so I took a lot of inspiration from, from my culture, from oral stories, from land-based practices, um, from other indigenous people. Um, I think that my love of land and my love of culture and my love of these characters really comes through. I think some of these characters um, have been with me since Island of, of Decolonial Love. And um, this was a chance to sort of deepen those characters. I had trouble with this idea of like plot and setting and characters and conflict that are you're supposed to have in the novel and the protagonist and then the antagonist and these kind of, there always has to be conflict. And I was like, as someone who is, is living through what it's like uh, to be um, colonized in 2020, I don't really need any more conflict in my life. Um, so I wanted the book to kind of feel like it was a refuge. And while there is a, a story, um, I really wanted to focus on on joy and uh, resistance and this just um, drive and persistence about being an Anishinaabe uh, anyway, in spite of all of the, the kind of, I don't think there's any, any characters in this book that are victims. They're all kind of trickster um, doing ceremony in Ikea you know, wearing Kankin backpacks, they're, they're, they're doing it anyway, in, in sometimes a very funny way. Thank you. Um, there's another question here in the chat. There's, there's a huge amount of gratitude in the chat. I just want to name that um, in case anyone is, is only listening or just so it's, so it's on the tape. Um, there's a huge amount of gratitude in mm. the chat. Um, and in particular for uh, the plethora of they them characters uh, mm. is really is really amazing uh, and, and overwhelming is the word. Um, uh, there's a question from Sharon. Um, can you say something about how this fits into the scope of resurgence? I think really the goal of resurgence is world building. And I think um, it's, it's hard work and it's difficult work. And uh, there's, there's part of that is imagining uh, a different future um, and building a different present. So the present can give kind of birth to this different future and it's messy and you don't, it's not sort of a pristine kind of romantic, we've got all the, we've got all the wonderful ingredients here. We just have to put them together, it's struggle. It's struggle because we're still uh, living under dispossession and anti-blackness and uh, racism and heteropatriarchy, um, all of these sorts of things that are undoing um, our worlds and ourselves and our bodies. And so this is a continual, very persistent, very deliberate, very strategic, very political, very a process full of resistance. Um, but it's about, it's about building a different way of relating to the land and relating to each other because the system that we have built right now is, is causing so much harm uh, to so many of the people that we love. And in this world, the uh, queerness is, is centered and, and, is, and is normal. Um, and there's a space for, for heterosexuality, but it's not centered. So I feel like this is, um, in my academic work, in academic work, you, you critique things and you gesture towards things. Uh, but what I like about creative work is you, you build it. And what I like about organizing is you build it. Um, so I like this idea of, I think that process of making new worlds, of organizing, of being the change that you wanna be or seeing a problem and organizing to fix it is a way of generating knowledge and is an embodied way of, of generating knowledge and theory. And I think that that's been really an important source of inspiration and knowledge in my own life. Um, there's a, a question that I'm hoping we have time to come back to you from Belinda um, further up about um, sort of navigating the written form um, and some practical questions. But as you were just describing, um, you know, creativity. Um, I'm wondering, there's a question from Chris. Um, you mentioned that un 
that Under Your Always Light started as a poem before becoming a song and eventually a short film. Um, Chris is interested in how your work and relationship to it evolves through different storytelling media. Um, could you share a bit more about what that experience is like? I really like seeing how my work travels in the world. Um, I like seeing what other artists, how they interpret it, how they uh, layer meaning. Um, I like the collaborative nature of, of making music and making uh, short films. Um, and so I think once that initial um, writing is, is something that's pretty solitary and, and pretty in my head. And it's that next stage of sort of, I don't love like the publicity parts and like trying to get people to sell your book and promoting it. But I really do like seeing, working with other artists and making new things and seeing and seeing um, how people connect to the work and, and, and how they uh, use it as a jumping off point. Um, so you can start to see uh, ideas and um, you start to see like one art piece influencing another art piece influencing. You start to see it travel and you start to see those threads. And um, I think that's a really beautiful part of, of this kind of work. Thank you for that. Um, you actually sort of did allude back to Belinda's question that we skipped over, um, if I can bring that in. Belinda, uh, I want to ask a question about retelling an indigenous origin story in print and the responsibility to the nation that is credited with the story and hopefully donating a portion of the profits to the nation. Um, if you could speak to that a little. It's a tricky business and I haven't, um, I, in Dancing on Our Turtle's Back, um, an elder at Namanatawabi agreed to um, write out her version of an origin story. And um, so it was used with her permission. Um, and otherwise I've relied on, on versions that are already written. I think it's a really big, um, in my culture, origin stories are very sacred and they're often told in, um, in ceremony. And so I think you have to be careful. And it's, they're also collectively owned and there's different versions and different elders have different versions. And so it can be very tricky to kind of navigate all of that. Um, and that was the only time that I've, I've done that is in Dancing on Our Turtles Back. Um, I think more and more it's, it's shifting. I think Doug has put, um, when he, he wrote his own book and has put an origin story in it. So over time, there's different elders are doing this work um, or are asking oral historians to help them do this work. And then I think that that, um, that starts to, to get more versions into print. But ultimately I would see it as, you know, that's Doug carries the responsibilities for that story or these elders carry the responsibilities for that story. And it's very difficult, I think, to enforce indigenous ethics once a story is in print. So it's something that you have to be pretty careful with. And it's, I think it has to be a collective kind of community decision with, with whoever owns whoever belongs to the story, I guess is how I would put it. Of that, um, that switch. Um, I'm, I'm, there are so many things here and, and Leanne, I'm gonna um, definitely send you the contents of this chat because um, there's, there's so much love in here for you um, and, and I want you to have that. Um, there are a couple questions I'm gonna sort of share two at once um, and, and you know, feel free to, to speak between them or, or to either. Um, Ezra asks, I was wondering if Leanne can speak about the title of the session, how she chose to call it um, The Cure for White Ladies. And then I'm, I'm connecting that with Meg's question um, loosely just because there's so many things. Meg asks, your book summary focuses on Anishinaabe aesthetics to describe how you've crafted the novel. Can you elaborate on the idea of aesthetics here in relation to the book? Uh, through its Anishinaabe utilization, particularly with regards to the plot's momentary time lapses with regard to healing. Um, okay, so the title of the book is a direct reference to the Susanna Moody book, Roughing It in the Bush. So her, her book is Roughing It in the Bush. She is the, the white lady. Nopaming means in the bush, 
And this book I'm offering up as the cure for white ladies. So that, that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question then is um, around healing and the temporal shifts. And what was the other thing? Um, aesthetics, Anishinaabe aesthetics. aesthetics. Yeah, so there's a different, um, meaning is communicated in a different way in Anishinaabe oral storytelling. And so there are techniques like repetition, like having this duality of the story taking place in the spiritual realm and in the, um, the physical realm. Um, these kinds of things that I've used to imbue the story with, with meaning. Um, time and temporality plays into that because um, there is, I'm assuming in the book that the spiritual world is, is alive and is influencing that our ancestors are right here with us in the present um, and, and we're conversing with them and they're influencing the world. So sort of a lot of the um, basic assumptions in the book are coming from, from that cultural place. Thank you. Um, I hope I'm not uh, missing anyone who's hoping to uh, voice their question. Um, if, if you are, um, feel free to say so in the chat or just to unmute yourself and, and chime in. Um, there are sort of, I'm seeing like about three different folks kind of all um, asking about um, sort of how you're how you navigate um, the academy and the non-academy. Um, I'm any any time that I try to sort of go in between um, reading out a question verbatim versus paraphrasing, I end up stumbling. <laughs> but there there are three different ones. Um, I don't know if you can see the chat and sort of um, yeah. choose which one. Um, I'm seeing Jennifer, Rochelle, and John kind of all asking about you know your contact with academia. Um, how that's how that's changed, or what your current contact with academia is, um, and how you think about, you know, how you theorize oral slash oral um, in your practice, kind of in an academic setting, um, in academic writing. John's asking if there's a way to cover both bases. Um, yeah. So I think there's also a question, sort of around ethics. Um, so I would use the term, I wouldn't use the term protocols, but I would use the term practice. So I have a practice of Anishinaabe ethics and there are certain ways that the stories, there's just a certain ethical practice culturally that's really important and that has been very exploited by the academy and also under the conditions of colonialism. Um, I'm not, what my relationship to the academy is, I don't, I mean, I'm here and we're in the academy right now. So I guess I pop in. Um, I am working at uh, De Chinta, which is a land-based post-secondary education project in the North. It's a bush um, on the land sort of post-secondary learning institution. I don't work at a university. I haven't worked at a university for 20 years. Every once in a while, I will do like a, a visiting professor gig or uh, a writer in residence sort of thing. But my practice has been based outside of the, the academy. I think the book, um, I think both Dancing on Our Turtles Back and As We Have Always Done deal with Anishinaabe aesthetics. There's a section in those books that deal with that very specifically, particularly As We Have Always Done. And um, that book actually, I think, makes a, a very good case for Anishinaabe intellectual traditions um, for theorizing and for the importance of oral oral practices. Um, so I think for those kind of, I think those questions, um, I think I've done a pretty good job of answering those questions in those books, just looking at the time and the number of, of questions here. Yeah. Agreed. Um, everyone be reading Leanne, uh, always. Um, Leanne, thank you so much again for sharing your time and, and your works with us this evening and thank you all for being here. Um, I hadn't realized actually that um, that Rebecca Belmore had done the, the art for the cover of the book um, but I'd been thinking about how you in Dancing on Our Turtles Back um, described Rebecca Belmore's performance piece 
And you talked about how she, for you with that piece altered the landscape um, and how that performance then was layered onto that landscape for you and, and for others who were there. Um, and I was thinking a lot about that with this evening and, and I really do believe in from all the love in the chat and on people's faces, I, I believe that you have altered the landscape here um, of Zoom amazingly. Um, and, and we're all on Zoom so much now and, and at least I moving forward, I think we'll, um, we'll continue to hear the echo of, of your work in this space um, in, in future Zoom rooms um, as bizarre as that is. Um, so I just, I want to thank you again um, so much for, for all of your work and for being here with us. Oh, thank you so much. You've been a fantastic um, audience and I'm happy that I got to spend this time with you. And uh, good luck with finishing the semester. Take care of yourselves. <laughs>